Testing, one, two, three. This is Greg Horton. Hello, uh, my name is Greg Horton, uh, Kilo 6 X-Ray Sierra Sierra, and uh, welcome to the Ham Radio Village uh, as part of DEF CON. I'm here today to talk about how to listen to the International Space Station with a $30 radio. Um, I'm an InfoSec professional by day. I've been interested in radio for over a decade, but was pretty intimidated about taking a ham radio exam. Um, I thought I wasn't smart enough to do it. It seemed hard. Um, but then when the pandemic hit, I said, what better time to then to do that since they were doing online testing. Um, so I got my license in September of 2020 last year, and I rushed and got my general because I really wanted to get on to HF. Um, and do that. And I've had my general since then. Uh, other pandemic passions have been gardening and finding whatever free fruit trees I can in my neighborhood and picking them. And as you can see, here's me. Uh, this is me on um, on one of the field days that uh, for uh, UHF and VHF uh, in the past year. So a quick primer. If you probably know what ham radio is, but just so we're, we are using the same terms. Uh, ham radio refers to amateur radio operators as licensed by the FCC, utilizing allocated frequencies. The FCC gives us, as ham radio operators, some frequencies to use um, with some, some limits and rules. Um, at, if we pass a test that, that um, shows our competency to use those in a responsible manner. Um, so which frequencies are we talking about? Well. This is the main stuff that you'll have to worry about with ham radio. We have um, 70 centimeters, which is uh, 420 to 450 megahertz, which we call UHF, our ultra high frequency. Um, you have VHF, which is 144 megahertz to 148 megahertz. We call that two meter. And this all refers to the length of the, uh, the, the waves. And then your HF is your 10 meters through 160 meters. And, Here's a very large chart of all the bands that we are allocated by the FCC. So there's some other things on here that I didn't cover, like six meters. Uh, there's some stuff also in 2,200 meters. Um, I don't know anybody with a radio that can do that, but um, if you're one of those people, uh, hit me up. I, I'm, I'm a little curious of, of what, what you do there. Um, but yeah, this is like the the amateur radio bands um, of which we can we can utilize uh, to, uh, given your uh, your different um, licensing. So radios, uh, a big thing about getting into ham radio is that like it's a good hobby to uh, spend money. Radios can be really expensive. You can spend a lot of money very quickly on some nice equipment. Um, and handheld radios are often expensive too. Uh, they're usually over $100. So the barrier to entry is like, okay, well, I get my license and now I have to, um, you know, get a radio and, and figure out what, what I want. And you're going to be spending, you know, 100, 200 bucks uh, easily. But a few years ago, a Chinese company brought a cheaper, um, uh, to the market, a cheaper option. Enter the Baofeng. Uh, specifically, the Baofeng UV5R. Now, uh, you can find these pretty much anywhere. I find them on wish.com, uh, amazon.com, uh, eBay, and they're 30 to 50 bucks roughly. If you're paying more than 50 bucks, you're probably paying too much. Um, they are four watt radios. They can transmit and receive on UHF and VHF. They don't have the same limits that um, most radios have. Like um, most of the radios you buy will prevent you from transmitting on, say, the police band. Uh, the Baofeng doesn't do that, so be careful. Um, some people hate these radios because of their build quality, but honestly, if you're looking for an easy um, way to get into ham radio, you can't beat the Baofeng. It's going to give you what you need. It's going to give you your basic functionality it, and and get you on the air, which is that's all that matters. Um, Um, but, you know, the Baofeng is all over the internet and you can find some really absurd ads for them. Uh, this one, for example, is claiming that this little handheld radio is 120 watts. 
Um, I would not hold a radio that can produce 120 watts to your head very often. Um, you might might have a bad time. Here's a quick little meme. Um, yeah, the FCC being afraid of of cheap handheld radios. But yeah, they're they're cheap. They they they're useful. And yeah, if you if you don't have a radio, I strongly suggest just getting one. You can even use it as a scanner, even if you're not licensed yet and you can't transmit. So, okay, so that's radios. So what's a repeater? So we have these little tiny handheld radios and they can get our signal maybe a block or two um, to another person. And that's all in, all in good if all you wanna do is pretend like you're using a walkie talkie. But say, if I wanna use my handheld radio to go 50 miles, how am I gonna do that? Well, different radio clubs will set up a repeater which will take your signal and rebroadcast it on a slightly different frequency um, that will propagate your signal that much further. And so um, the local club in my town uh, maintains a repeater and we have regular net nets on, on the repeater where we, where we talk, but it enables us to get pretty far out and, and contact each other when normally I would be, I would be limited to just my, um, my local neighborhood uh, when it comes to having a handheld radio. So this is, it's a pretty nice thing that um, an element of ham radio. And guess what? There's a repeater on the International Space Station. Isn't that cool? So you can, if you get your signal up to the International Space Station, it'll broadcast it back down at a different frequency. And that means that you can, um, you can contact people. I'm in the San Francisco Bay Area uh, through the ISS repeater. I can hear people from Arizona. That's amazing with something that's like, the size of my hand, you know? Uh, this is a picture of the International Space Station and where the um, radios are, are um, located. There's a, uh, a Kenwood on the Russian side of the ISS and an Ericsson on the European side. So how do you listen to the International Space Station? Well, here are some of the frequencies. So the, U the VHF and UHF repeater uh, downlink is at uh, 437.80, so that's how you would listen to it. So if you just wanna listen to um, the people uh, on it, that's fine, um, or the people using the repeater. Uh, the uplink is how you would transmit, uh, is at 145.99 with a PL of 67 Hertz. Uh, the voice and in, in, in slow scan TV downlink is 145.80 and that's worldwide. And the voice uplink, um, is 144.49 for ITU regions two and three. So that's the Americas and the, and the Pacific and Southern Asia. Uh, when you're dealing with the uh, International Space Station, turn off your squelch. You don't want squelch to get in the way of you, you, you catching a signal. And because the International Space Station is going over you, um, you may not have that long of a time to actually uh, catch the signal. So turn off the squelch entirely when you're trying to listen. Uh, so I mentioned slow scan television. Yeah, you can send images. Um, well, you can receive images. The, um, the International Space Station does regular events where they will do special commemorative images that, that you can uh, pick up while, um, while the, um, the International Space Station passes over you. So if you have a, um, your radio and you have a cell phone that has a um, slow scan television program, you can just pick up that signal and it'll produce a fo photo for you. Um, this is one from when they were uh, commemorating um, Russian um, cosmonauts on the ISS. Uh, there was recently one for, um, for the June field day that they did. And I was able to get one of those images while in a moving car with a handheld radio. Um, pretty neat. So how do you track, how do you know when the ISS is over you and how do you track it? Well, I use ISS detector and it's an Android app. And I set my phone to give me an alert when there's a pass. So I'll, it'll, it'll bother me and be like, hey, in 30 minutes, there's gonna be a, a, an ISS pass. And, and I'll go, okay, I'll try to, try to grab the signal from this one. I'll get my antenna out. I'll get my radio out. I'll get prepped. I'll get out in my yard and then wait for it to come overhead. There's also a website, Heavens Above, which will give you all kinds of information about the, um, the International Space Station passing over you and also um, feature some other amateur satellites. Um, yeah. 
So how do you listen? Uh, you use your handheld radio, and, or you can get a directional antenna. You can point towards the sky. Um, in the photo on the left, you want to hold your radio at, a, um, at this angle. It'll get you a better signal as it's passing over. This won't do as well. Up and down, not as good. Um, on the right here, I'm using an Ed Fong J-Pole, uh, which is a small PVC pipe um, antenna with, with, with a wire J-Pole on the inside. And this does pretty well. I was able to pick up signals and, and make contacts with it, but it's not directional. So you're kind of like dancing around, trying to pick up the signal as it's passing over you. Um, a Yagi antenna though, on the other hand, this one is from Arrow antennas. This is a directional antenna. So this is like, if you know where the ISS is, if it's nighttime, you can actually see it passing. You can see the blinking lights. You can point this antenna directly at it and then follow it as you go across the sky. Um, and this is gonna be your best bet is using a Yagi antenna. Um, so, you know, you can, you can track the ISS, you can get an antenna, you can point it there. But something here we need to think about also is the pass angle. So, um, a pass angle of 90 degrees is going to be right straight over you. A pass angle of zero degrees is right on the horizon. So there is a, a range of passes of, um, of how you're going to be able to contact the ISS. And like the closer to 90 degrees, the better the pass is going to be for you. And the longer time that you're going to have to actually pick up the signal. Uh, something that's going to be more closer to the horizon you're going to be blocked by hills. You're going to be blocked by buildings. Um, and also the pass will be just a few minutes. Um, with a 90 degree pass, it's, um, it's about nine minutes. So you have an, an, enough time to make, make some quick contacts with people. So with the pass angles, we also need to talk about some basic physics called the Doppler effect. So those who don't know, the Doppler effect is this um, a physics phenomenon where as a, um, as a signal is moving away from you, you will perceive it as a, at a lower frequency than, is, than if it's coming at you. And the most a common real world example of this is um, ambulances. So you, when you hear a, a loud ambulance pass you or, or a fire truck, it'll, you know, It'll start at a high frequency, and then as it goes, it goes. Ooh. That's the Doppler effect. That's physics. Um, Doppler effects also um, is famous for in ast astronomy that we can tell that stars are moving away from us because the light on them is blue shifted, um, shifting to a, a, a lower frequency. Um, yeah. So, what does the Doppler effect have to do with this? Well. As with sound or light, radio waves are just another form of electromagnetic uh, radiation. So um, with that, we have to adjust our radio to better pick up the signal. Now, you can set it smack dab in the middle of whatever the, um, the frequency is going to be for the International Space Station, um, and you can make contacts that way. But if you want to have better success, what you're going to want to do is, as it's coming towards you, you're going to want to bump your uh, frequency up by um, by one kilohertz, two kilohertz. That you, some people will do like by five kilohertz steps or, or um, megahertz steps, um, just to kind of grab the signal. And then as it's going away from you, you will adjust your radio to 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 go the other direction to go lower. Um, this is just to take into account for the for the Doppler effect. Um, yeah, this is an example in like chirp of how you could program this. So as you can see in the frequency column, we have some frequencies there that, um, you know, take into account the Doppler effects. So you can switch through them quickly as the pass is, is, is making its way. Um, yeah. And here are some more examples of um, what, what um, frequencies you might want to hit um, when when dealing with the with the Doppler effect, uh, this is for the ISS voice downlink and the packet um, downlink and uplink. 
And this is for the voice crossband downlink and uplink. So this is the, the repeater um, frequencies. So I'm talking a lot about a repeater on the ISS, but I don't want to contact other hams. I just want to hear astronauts. Well, good luck. Hearing astronauts is very rare. Uh, astronauts, uh, the ham radio program isn't a part of like their everyday work. It's something that they do for fun. So, con and so catching a, an astronaut is, uh, is a lot of luck. Uh, astronauts will plan contacts with schools. So that's actually a really good way for um, to hear um, the astronauts is if you want to pay attention to the, um, the International Space Station ham radio website, They'll tell you when they're when they're doing a contact with a school, and if it's a school near you, you can catch it and listen to it. Um, don't try to you know inter interrupt that because they are they are making a um, a contact for uh, their their school program, of course. Um, but yeah, that's a fun way to listen to it, and you might get lucky if you listen to the voice um, the voice frequency. Sometimes there is is astronauts. I've never heard any, and I have heard of one person who. A, a, per, a friend of a friend, they were able to make a successful contact with an actual astronaut. Most of the time, you're going to be, um, you'll, you'll use this for the repeater. And so you'll be able to contact other, other hands. And the contacts are very quick. So um, when I'm making a contact uh, through the ISS repeater, I'll be like, K6XSS, Charlie Mike 88. Charlie Mike 88 is my grid square. Um, K6XSS, Charlie Mike 88. And then somebody will be like, you know, re respond with their call sign and their grid square. And then I'll be like, 73, you know, QSL. Um, and then that'll be logged as a, as a, as a quick contact. Um, if you get one or two contacts during a pass, that's pretty good. Um, especially if you're running a handheld radio um, at only like four, four or five watts. If you want to have better success, run more watts. Use something that's more of a, a base station. Um, if you really wanted to get advanced, you could get a Yagi antenna that was on a rotator and pointed at the at the at the um, where you where the ISS is going to be, and then follow it um, as it passed. I don't know anybody doing that, but that would that's how I would do it. Um, but I definitely have um, I have friends who who do ISS contacts who just do it from their base station and they run you know twenty to twenty five watts. Um, and they're able to make a lots of successful contacts. It's much harder to do it with a handheld radio, but I have done it and you can do it. Um, yeah. So all this information about uh, contacting the International Space Station, it's not just for the International Space Station. So amateur radio operators like, like myself, um, like they can do their own amateur radio satellites. Um, they, you know, they are repeaters as well. They're flying around space. They pass a little bit differently. Like their, um, their passes are a little quicker sometimes because they're faster. Um, but yeah, it's the same. It's the same stuff. So the um, the ISS detector app that I mentioned that is for Android also supports um, some of the amateur radio. Um, uh, satellites, so you can put those in as well and get 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 um get contacted when those are passing over you, and you can try to make contacts off of those too. But the ISS is definitely the one that I think more people are uh, know about and and are into. So uh, another thing about the International Space Station and the repeater on it is that um, it's not always up, and you'll want to check the status of it. Um, because sometimes, like a few months back, um, they did a spacewalk and they replaced a cable, and then the ham radio was down for a few months. Happens, you know. You, I, I'm sure all of us have had that that um, situation where you replace just, you know, you're like, oh, I'll just replace a, a bit of wire, a, a cable, you know, and then the whole thing doesn't work, and you're like, oh, I shouldn't even have touched it. It was that sort of situation, but they were able to fix it and get it up and running again. Um, currently, the um, the Kenwood is the one that is that is operational, and it's in packet mode right now. So if you do packet radio, uh, this would be a good good um, thing for you to to play with. 
the next mode change is going to be back to a cross-band repeater, so using a UHF and VHF uh, repeater. And that's going to happen in late August. So you have time. You can get your antenna together. You can get your radio together. You can start practicing pointing it outside. You can get all of your notifications set up so you can catch a good pass. So we got some time um, to, to get ready for when they're, when they're back up and running. Thank you. Uh, want more? Um, if you're not licensed, please get licensed. Um, if you haven't taken advantage of the licensing this weekend, um, there are lots of groups that are doing licensing online. There's some groups that are, st that are now starting to do um, in-person licensing again. So please take a look at that. Um, if you have any questions, uh, contact me at k6xss at uh, the arrl.org. Uh, that'll go to my email. And I have a website. I have one article up there about um, the ISS stuff. Um, contacting space is pretty fun to me, and it's something I want to do more of. So thank you very much, and hope you're having a great DEF CON. <laughs>